This lecture serves as an index and glossary by which we use to judge the overall conformation of any horse we see in reality. We of course use the diagram of a symmetrically perfect horse and a symmetrically perfect skeleton. The diagram I will be using can be found online by searching for a symmetrical skeleton of horse diagram. The diagram I will be making my determinations from originally is included with points 1 to 32, each point from 1 through 32 being a different area of prognosis, of diagnosis, of measurement, of determining the functionality and efficiency of movement within each point. We should also be looking for symmetric angles to which the horse can stride towards achieving or have the functionality, the ability to be trained to achieve in order to produce a specimen worthy of breeding that uses the maximum efficiency of all techniques incorporated by a trainer of adequate ability. Point one on the diagram through 32 are listed as follows. Number one, the skull. Two, mandible. Three, scapula. Four, shoulder joint. Five, humerus. Six, elbow joint. Seven, radius and ulna, 8, carpal joint, 9, 4th metacarpal joint, 10, 3rd metacarpal joint, also known as the cannon bone more commonly, 11, the fetlock joint, 12, the pastern joint, 13, coffin joint, 14, navicular bone, 15, point of elbow, 16, patella, 17, stifle joint, 18, tibia, 19, long pastern bone, 20, coffin bone, 21, short pastern bone, 22, proximal sesamoid bones, 23, tarsal joint, commonly known as the hawk, 24, fibula, 25, femur, 26, point of buttock, 27, pelvis, 28, point of croup, 29, point of hip, 30, spinous process, 31, vertebrae of neck, 32, hip joint. If you are interested in a mathematical formula that provides a calculation on which to deduce or attribute statistical values for all of these points, you can contact me at my personal email address. But in general terms, we will be using these 32 points, these 33, 32 degrees of judgment in order to form a composite picture of the total predictable value of the horse's wins, losses, and overall success. Some terms that should be clarified before proceeding with the lecture series are as follows. Number one, until I'm done, should be quick. The pole is the bony prominence lying between the ears. The crest is the curved top line of the neck. The forehead should be broad, full, and flat. 
the nostrils should be capable of wide dilation to permit the maximum amount of air to flow. The muzzle, the lips should be firm. The lower lip should not have any tendency to sag or unnecessarily quiver. The point of shoulder is the hard bony prominence surrounded by heavy muscle masses. The breast is a muscle mass between the forelegs covering the front of the chest. The ideal chest is deep and contains the space necessary for all the vital organs. The forearm should be well muscled and it should extend from the elbow to the knee. The knee is the joint between the forearm and the cannon bone. The coronet is the band around the top of the hoof from which the hoof wall grows. The hoof refers to the horny wall and the sole of the foot. The foot includes the horny structure and the pedal bones and the vacular bones as well as other connective tissue. The pastern extends from the fetlock to the top of the hoof. The flexor tendons run from the knee to the fetlock joint and can be seen prominently lying behind the cannon bone while it runs parallel to the cannon bone, it is known to be a flat bone. The fetlock joint is the joint between the cannon bone and the pastern joint. The fetlock joint should be large and clean, just as should all joints. The cannon bone lies between the knee and the fetlock joint, and it is visible from the front of the leg. It should be straight. The hock is the joint between the gaskin and the cannon bone found in the rear leg. It is the bony protuberance at the back of the hock that is called the point of hock. The gaskin is the region between the stifle and the hock. The stifle is the joint at the end of the thigh that corresponds to the human knee. The flank is the area below the loin between the last rib and the massive muscles of the thigh. The croup lies between the loin and the tail. The loin is the coupling or the short area joining the back to the powerful muscular croup, also commonly referred to as the rump the croup and the rump, famous, uh, famously interchangeable. The back extends from the base of the withers to where the last rib is attached. The withers is the prominent ridge where the neck and the back join. At the withers, powerful muscles of the neck and shoulders attach to elongated spines of the second and the sixth thoracic vertebrae. The height of a horse is measured vertically from the withers to the ground because the withers is the horse's highest constant point. The throat latch is the neck area that allows the horse ease of flexation. The Neck is blended smoothly into the withers and the shoulders, and it should not emerge or appear to emerge between the front legs. The shoulders should be overlain with lean, flat muscle and blend well into the withers. The barrel should be narrower at the shoulders and wider at the point of coupling, or as I've said, the loins. Girth is the point that a horse should be measured to determine the heart girth, which can be used to determine the horse's minimum and maximum weight. 
The elbow is a bony prominence lying against the chest at the beginning of the forearm. The hind quarters give power to the horse. They should be well muscled and are one of the most important factors when dealing with thoroughbred race horse, race horses, excuse me. Now that we're done with the vocabulary terms, I'm just briefly going to give a description of the most common signs of unsoundness in a horse and the location of these common blemishes or visual distinctive indicative signs that should be counted against the value of the stock. Number one, a bog spavin. A bog spavin is a soft filing of the natural depression of the hock due to distension of the joint capsule located on the inside and to the front of the hock. Number two, bone spavin, position number 12. This is a heritable trait which leads to lameness. It is a bony enlargement on the inside and the front of the hock where the base of the hock tapers into the cannon bone. The next term is bowed tendons. Bowed tendons is a thickened enlargement of one or any or all of a group of tendons and ligaments which occupy the posterior space in the cannon region between knee and fetlock joint or between hock and fetlock joint. Most commonly seen on the front legs is where this occurs. Our next term, our next distinction for common blemishes related to unsoundness are capped knees, knees and elbows known as a shoe boil. These shoe boils are swellings located on the point of joints which are caused by injuries that result in excess synovial fluid secretion. As I've said before in previous lectures, whenever you see a discolored substance like a salty white sweat dripping from any joint, any point on the typical skeleton, the horse should be discarded from selection. The next term is a curb. A curb is an enlargement just below the point of the hock due to ligament injury. The fistula is an inflamed condition usually associated with the withers region. Forging is a term known as a defective way of travel where the bottom of the horse's forefoot is struck by the toe of the ipsilateral hind foot during stride. The term founder is also called laminitis. It is a serious ailment of the fleshy lamini. And the exact causes are unknown, but it's associated with symptoms of overeating, overwork, or uterine inflammation following foaling. The term heaves refers to respiratory ailments characterized by forced exhalation. A hernia is a common protrusion of an internal organ through the wall of a containing cavity. It's generally associated with intestinal protrusion through abdominal muscle. What's known as parrot mouth means, in other words, a term for an overshot jaw. It implies that the horse's incisors meet improperly or disproportionately. 
A pole of evil is an inflamed condition associated with the pole. A ring bone is a term used to describe a bony enlargement near the coronary band, which may involve pastern joint or the coffin joint. It's usually associated with a stress injury and poor conformation. The term side bone indicates an ossification of the lateral cartilage usually seen in front feet. It's generally associated with excess stress, concussion, and poor conformation. The term splint refers to a calcification between the splint and cannon bones induced by injury or stress. Generally seen on front of legs. The next term is when a horse has been stifled. This means there has been a dislocation of the patella, which causes for the fixation of a leg in an extended position for a long duration of time. The term Sweeney denotes atrophy of shoulder muscles due to paralysis of supracapsular nerve. Finally, toe and quarter cracks are terms used to delineate a split in the toe or the quarter area of the hoof wall. Again, thank you for enduring this glossary of terms, but I felt it was necessary to come to a basic consensus in order to understand the future lecture on this overall subject matter. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attentiveness and your endurance in this endeavor to understand equine conformation. I'll see you at the next lecture.